All right. Without further ado, <laughs> uh, GraphQL, the industry insights. Uh, Dan uh, has been working in the uh, the tech industry for, we'll just say for a while, and has, <laughs> has, has those insights. Uh, oh. <laughs> and I can't wait to hear them. So, Dan, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can uh, start Thank sharing you. yours. Excellent. And if you want to give um, a little bit more of introduction uh, to yourself and Toby, uh, that'd be great. Absolutely, will do. Um, while I get the share going, Toby is one of our top um, sales engineers. Do you want to introduce yourself, Toby, while I put up the share screen? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks, Dan. It's a pleasure to meet you all, uh, Google Developer Group. Um, and as I said, my name is Toby Adebisi, and I work at Apollo as a sales um, solutions engineer. Um, and my role at Apollo is basically um, how do I set teams up for success on a technical basis. So when we're talking about, talking about architecture, um, I've worked with a lot of Fortune 500 companies and setting up their super graph um, plans. Um, so how do I transfer that knowledge to new companies looking to do the same thing? Um, so that's what I do. And typically I collaborate with Dan on the product yeah. slash yeah community side and then joey on like the sales side perfect thank you mm -hmm. good segue um this is me i was a dev for i don't know 10 15 years and then a uh, long stint at expedia um and two just two points to share one over those two decades spent a lot of time doing larger and larger projects and big migrations and modernization efforts um and learn sort of what works, what doesn't work, why do they succeed and fail, the last of which was a GraphQL uh, API strategy to unify. And you'll, I'll explain a little bit more of that, why that is. Um, and so joined Apollo about three years ago, and I've been really interested in just playing a role of trying to help, like Jim does, bring a community of people who are trying to do this work together. And uh, we have a Slack community that you see mentioned there that's got a lot of organizations in it and champions. Um, so everything I'm going to talk about today is really what I've learned, some from my own experience, but also more broadly from all these other organizations. And I really want to just kind of answer this question for you today, which is, why are you hearing about GraphQL? And what is going on? Because um, you shouldn't adopt any technology because a vendor tells you it's cool or because, you know, it seems shiny. Um, and these organizations, I will tell you, are pretty serious about the work they do. They don't just pick up new tech unless it's really valuable for them. So I thought what we'd do is use the opportunity that Jim has uh, given us uh, in the, to use the travel lens and talk about at least those top two travel companies and give some example and then broaden about why they adopted GraphQL, why they're putting GraphQL at the center of kind of their API stack. And then try to pull out and do a mixture of sort of big picture theory that will reference sort of where this industry has come from as we've moved through different API tech and then a little bit of a di deep dive with Toby into um, our GraphOS platform and some actual touch and taste so you can see GraphQL working in case you haven't played with it before. And that will help you, I think, connect the dots. So I'm going to jump in. Um, please, I am i can't see the questions right now because of the slide stuff, but Jim will collect them. And Jim, feel free to stop me and pause and ask a question on a slide. I'm, I'm uh, very comfortable with it doing it. All right. Interactive. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so I joke here, this is one of our taglines is API layer for the modern stack, but really let's talk about the modernizing stack because I think that's the state that we're all in, right? Our stacks are never done. And successful companies um, have on the front end, this kinds of thing. This is, this is, this is success uh, circa four or five years ago at Expedia. Micro optimizations across seven brands that we had acquired and integrated across hundreds of little UI touch points. You can think of a product manager and a designer behind every one of those little screens. This, this was a, something the design team at Expedia put together. But the challenge was there isn't in that, there, that is micro-optimization, but there isn't is any brand identity, right? And there isn't any leverage. Because if you build all of those little mini views, we might call them micro front ends now, although this architecture wasn't built that way. What you see there is decision and logic formatting, um, localization at the edge, at the edge tier. And that means that if you want to make a change or add a new thing or make anything consistent across that, you've got to do it in a hundred leaf nodes, not once at the root. 
And what Expedia found was they had added people after teams after people, and they were getting a point of diminishing return. And they couldn't then work on what they really wanted to work on, which was their challenge number two. Jim will tell you that though travel, we think of, you know, it's buying a flight reservation or getting a hotel or a car rental or an activity. In fact, those are just the mechanisms by which you get to somewhere you want to go, have a bed to sleep in when you get there and have something to do um, when you're there with activities and maybe a rental car for the day. You don't want actually to book cars. You want to have access to a car when you get there. And so the trip is really what people want from a travel organization. And Expedia knew this in its DNA. But technologically, as we went from our original monolithic platform, I said, I just slipped in a Wii there. I was there so long. When Expedia was in the early days, they had a monolithic thing where all this was integrated. But as soon as we broke out into microservices, um, all those siloed API things started to diverge. And we got all these siloed APIs. Where then was the ability to pull that together into a consistent experience and to do something like trip planning, which is really what we wanted to do to differentiate ourselves? And the answer is there wasn't anything. There was no commonality upon which to connect together that stuff. And so trip effort after trip planner effort failed while I was there. And so finally, the decision was made, like, I think the problem is at the API tier, which is that we need to create an abstraction layer that means there is something in common between car product and flight product and activity product, because there was certainly nothing in common in the platform tier. And that's one of the ways that people um, and organizations use GraphQL is to put an abstraction tier in between their front end experiences and their back end domain realities such that they can actually build the kinds of experiences they wanted to. In the particular case at Expedia, um, one of the first things we did with it was to, for the third time since I'd been there, migrate all of our trips and itineraries over to a new platform and a new front end. And this time we used a component sort of server driven, very design system integrated technique that leveraged this fact that we could unify across all these different line of businesses and build this in a componentized sort of design led way. And the result was, you know, about a, it took three years the last time I did this before we had the graph. And the second time during the pandemic, we did it in one year. So it's just an example of the leverage you can get when you think about this strategic layer between your front and backs. And I'll give you a diagram to illustrate that better in a second. But hopefully that gives you an idea about the the business reason why organizations are bringing GraphQL in the one point. Um, so booking.com, even bigger than Expedia. Um, this is some slides. I'm just going to share the slides from a booking.com um, individual who who uh, presented at a webinar we did. Um, this is in their own words. They had built an amazingly powerful Perl monolith that we just, they couldn't modernize, right? They were just stuck with it. And so they had experimentation, but they had no systematic division of uh, separation of concerns in their stack. And so they looked also at, to modernize and unsurprisingly, they came up with the same conclusion, which was that a graph tier was what was needed. It was frankly the only architecture where they could create um, a synthetic, if you will, API that represented what they really wanted to project as their API for their front end, while their back ends were still very complicated, messy, and in the process of being broken up from that Perl monolith. So I heard Jim mention the move to the cloud. Uh, it's another point that I'll make reference to later, but the point of using the graph tier as an abstraction and a declarative abstraction layer that's independent of the code of the APIs, the actual um, service level work, allows you to move more quickly uh, wait, there's a note coming in. I've almost seen it. Uh, yeah, BFF. So we're going to get to BFFs in just a second. This is exactly right. So uh, often, often that um, solving the same problem that we try to do with backends for front ends is where the graph first comes in. Sometimes we call that experience APIs. But there's a twist that's coming on BFFs, and I'll share that in just a second. Um, let's see. A few more quotes just, just to highlight from that presentation. This is interesting. I want to call this out. The benefits we mentioned, Anoop mentioned BFFs. The benefits of GraphQL is traditionally to the front end. I'm going to give you some examples of that. Um, it's It's been talked about on a million presentations for almost the last 10 years. But what's interesting is his quote here, uh, what, um, what Matt said, GraphQL gives us the ability on the back to decouple our front end from our back end 
empowering us to easily pursue critical changes necessary to adopt a better service architecture and improve the speed in which we could make changes. So that decoupling, as we'll show, I'll have some diagrams of this, but the decoupling of the front and the back without the direct endpoint based approach is what gave them the flexibility they needed. And then um, finally, from a takeaway perspective, if you can get all your services to contribute to kind of a growing graph or almost visually think of it as a mesh of your APIs where each piece is contributing to a larger whole, then you give yourself the ability for new capabilities to be used in the future without having to rewrite your APIs. So we'll talk about this in specific, uh, but I just wanted to call out that two completely different companies from completely different code bases and backgrounds all came to the, both came to the same conclusion. And this story is the same in FinTech and in e-commerce and, and lots of other verticals. I think what's going on here is this, that certainly it was the case at Booking and, at, and uh, at Expedia, which was that as those platforms got mature and they got richer and richer, there was a, an output problem, which was that more energy went in, but less came out. And so more of the time was spent with maintenance and upkeep um, and less of it on building new capabilities that the business really needed. And what they saw, it, of course, was the reverse. You want that the more you contribute, you get almost you get a more than linear return on results. Um, and that just hasn't happened when we use rest in the middle. So I'm going to try to sum this up. Three, I think these four things are what we're all under, right? We have this omni-channel client problem which is that now we don't just have one or two clients, we have lots of clients. We have pressure to deal with acquisitions and mergers. Sabre has had a complex story. So has Expedia, so has Booking. Um, our back offices or back house or back ends or server, however you think about it, they're not only messy, they're gonna get messier and winning companies have messy back ends. That's the, this the, the fact of it. The loser company is the ones with the beautiful, single, clear, Toby smiling, because it's true. If your back end is gorgeous and clean, it's probably because you haven't, uh, you haven't had to deal with enough realities. Um, and absolutely, mainframes, uh, we see AS400s, we see, we see SOAP, we see all that stuff. And you can't, um, that pressure to modernize, we can't, we can't keep replacing our back ends um, in order to get the new benefit. Like it, it takes years to do one of those deep, you know, migrations. And so what we seek is the ability to get those front ends into the future that we want to live in, even though there is still a reality that's kind of the messy background. And we'll just do mapping and model mapping and translation. That's what GraphQL is really good at is almost like a facade layer. Um, and let's all be clear in 2023, there's pressure to move, move faster, but we have less devs. So how can we get mechanical leverage and have more of our front end code written for us, do less manual model transforms, deal with less endpoint integrations, all that sort of annoying stuff that we've been doing for a long time with APIs. So that's sort of the problem statement. Um, why, why can't we, why, why GraphQL? Why do we need another API tech? Why can't we just use what we've used before? And I made a, a, a mention of it before, but here's sort of my argument. Uh, I was there when so happened. I'm from Seattle, so the Amazon and the pizza team stuff was close to me. Um, it was brilliant at making a lot of those bubbles and boxes um, on the right-hand side. Service creation and the fact that you could have a smallish team that builds a couple services, hooks them to a data source, and could publish that endpoint it was tremendously transformative on the back ends. But it does beg a question, which is like, how do you wire all that stuff up and orchestrate it to the front ends? Um, and the traditional way, I'll go now from the big theory down to a little bit of a more of a practice. And the traditional way we're all familiar with, right? We fetch information about the user. We use that user ID to fetch information about the transaction list. In this case, that's step two. And then step three, we go ask in parallel for each of the information about the request, all to fill out this user experience. And, you know, make no doubt that worked. It's how we built all of our 1.0 and even some of the 2.0 apps, Expedia, Uber, everything right um but it isn't very optimal from a bytes over the wire perspective it's not very fast because you're making multiple round trips and you get things like you know a whole bunch of overfetch where all i really want is a few fields but i get the whole payload um and that has a downside maybe we'll touch on it later toby when you show the observability but it's also bad not just that i send too many bytes over the wire a lot of times that doesn't matter that much sometimes but it also means that the 
back end service team has no idea what they're, what you really use. They don't, they just know that you're making a call to the user service. And every time there's a new field to be added, they add it to the list and they have to give it back every time, which means it's really hard to optimize. Which bits should they cache? What are the important bits? With GraphQL and a query, you'll see in a minute, you get to know what that is. And that's really a powerful thing. So today's discussion and challenges about what are we doing in the middle? Because there are a lot of different front end clients that are trying to figure out what to, how to make things from our API endpoints. And we can't just all wire it up to, together with REST. That doesn't scale anymore. Um, so back to that example, this is a very high level way to think about GraphQL, a single query where you ask, you describe declaratively, these are all the data points that I need to know to power that UI. And those come from a variety of different underlying endpoints and services. But you describe that in a declarative way rather than in a sort of endpoint based way. So I decide to find a query, it's just like a database and I ask for the things and it figures out the translation, they've all been registered and um, it figures out how to go get those things for me. And that means I don't have to know or talk to all the different service teams. I don't have to know if that endpoint's been moved to the cloud or a new VPC or whatever it is, I just need to ask for the stuff. And that means that my front end teams and my back end teams can work um, more asynchronously. It's a like a sort of a publish subscribe where I can push things in as I get new data into the graph and I can consume them on different cycles. Um, and that is, so GraphQL as a tech is cool. The query stuff is cool. You'll see the type language in a second, but the fundamental thing on the team level is each of us can spend more time doing the bit of our job that we were hired to do and less time with the annoying sort of middleware. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and we'll move out of theory and we'll just actually see some real GraphQL and how you, uh, how you use it. Let me find the button to stop. There it is, Toby, all yours. So Toby's going to show, um, bits of our, uh, of our online portal that lets you access everything you want to do about the graph. Go ahead, Toby. Oh, still on mute. The classic, can you hear me yet? Um, <laughs> can you see my screen? Yeah, you're good. Awesome. Um, so basically what you're looking at right now um, is what we call GraphOS Studio. Um, and i to demo to you because it conceptualizes a lot of the things we're talking about very well. Um, with GraphOS, you're able to kind of reason around your schema and make different operations. Um, in the few minutes that we have here, I'm going to demo two for two personas. The first is from the perspective of an API consumer. Um, and the second is from the perspective of the service provider that is creating the API. So like a backend engineer. So take, for example, you get hired into a new company and which has happened a lot. Um, and you have to then understand what is going on in the API landscape. Um, in the past, when I've switched jobs, sometimes it takes a week, depending on the place. Sometimes it takes a month to be able to contribute meaningful things to the company's API. Um, but with GraphOS and with, with GraphQL generally, um, you can basically understand the graph um, very, very quickly because um, you can see how the entire enterprise is separated into different what we call subgraphs. Um, for example, this example you're seeing here is an e-commerce example where you can see there's a subgraph or a team for checkouts. There's a subgraph for customers, and each of this has its own schema. There's a subgraph for orders. There's a subgraph for products. Um, and as a new developer or even an existing developer that's working on a different team. I can make sense of the schema of the organization pretty quickly. Um, I'm also able to discover the API schema. So for example, if I wanted to search for something, if there's, um, there's let's say maybe like a name field, or if I'm looking for like, I, like for tags. So for example, if you wanted to filter by different tags, you can do that. Um, you can filter by, let's say checkouts. And if you're in this particular field, you can go, um, look for fields that have been deprecated. Um, so quickly you can see in your graph how to kind of maneuver very quickly through your graph and understand um, and contribute to the graph very quickly. 
Um, so there's a neat tool here called we call Explorer. Um, so I was trying to search earlier. So if you wanted to search for like, um, let's say name, for example, name doesn't exist here, but like an ID, you see all the different schema types that have ID, reviews, orders, um, or if there are categories you want to you want to search, you can do that very quickly. Um, additionally, let's say you wanted to build a query, for example, let's build an example query. Like here, we see that we can dig into a customer. Let's say we wanted a customer email, contact phone number, auto history, for example, get the items that they've done. Um, like I don't have to have any domain knowledge, for example, to be able to make this example query. Um, and I can begin to see, oh, this, I already made a query and I get a response immediately. Um, if I wanted to uh, make so, for example, you could also look at what we call a query plan. You can see how that query is tra traversing across all your different subgraphs from microservices. Um, you can also, let's say, let's make this a little bit more interesting. If I wanted to see categories, for example, I can see how the graph OS is in parallel making calls to customer, making calls to products. And if we continue to add different subgraphs to the same query, like, like Dan was saying, uh, we'll see how that query plan executes across how many different levels of complexity that we make. Um, you can also see what the responses look like. Um, and here with Graph OS, you can, as a API Explorer, for example, um, there's even more information that you get. You see next to some of these fields here, there's estimation of how long calls would take. And Graph OS knows this information because this, uh, which we'll dive into very shortly, with the metrics and tracing that is sent to Apollo, um, there's all this calculation of like, oh, on average, this is how long um, this particular field would take, this is how long. So now if I'm an API developer trying to make a query, um, now I have a very data-driven approach to make an efficient query. Uh, and hopefully use this information to make sure that I'm not making calls that take forever to make, um, or at the very least have that data point to say like, okay, this is the cost analysis of it. This call maybe it might take more than one second. Um, and talking about that, um, if you were to flip to the other side of the house um, and say, okay, as a service developer, how do I understand what is going on in my API? For example, back in the day, I used to be in automotive and we anecdotally knew that when you make the call to start your car with your phone, uh, for some reason, it takes a long time, but we never really understood what level of the stack was holding it up, why it was taking a long time. But we just knew that as developers, like, oh yeah, that's what happens to Pappy. Like if, if you make this call, it's gonna take a while. Um, but with Graph OS and having all that insight into your super graph architecture, you can say, okay, like for example, this call that is taking two seconds, why is it taking two seconds? And you can really dig deep to see the request rate, the latency distribution. You can go through the traces and see how it goes through each and every subgraph to better understand, okay, I see here this is 144 milliseconds, um, but we see like most of the hold up here is probably wait, just waiting for potentially server responding. So now your team is um, getting educated on like, how do we reduce the bottlenecks? Um, and also, for example, like in different architectures, you probably have a more interesting data point. It might be that maybe database collisions causing more slow data retrieval. But with this, you get a lot of access to understanding, first of all, what your queries are looking like and also how, so this is a more interesting query plan. You see that the, there can be more complex example. This goes, I think across many different, if I were to expand my screen, for example, this goes across many different subgraphs. That's potentially why that query is actually slow. Um, so this gives you that data-driven approach to understand even things like errors. Um, if there were errors, you get to understand that as well. Um, and one interesting thing about this, and I think when I joined Apollo, this was just one of the things that stood out to me the most, was that yes, having operations and having data-driven approach is super important. Um, but I think where this doubles in effect is now we can act this data 
uh, all of this usage data of how the graph is being used to drive safety of the graph. And what do I mean by that? So let's take, for example, um, this is, we call this Supergirl. Let's look at a schema real quick. So let's say you're on the product team. You've built your product, right? And you have a product has an ID, has a title like we queried earlier. It has different prices. You, you've created this and this is your domain. You own this. Um, and then there's a team, a reviews team. That team now is capable of extending the functionality of a product. Like you on the product team, you don't really need to care about what a review is. But if I'm on the reviews team, I have the ability now with Federation to say, okay, this is product that was created by Jim's team. Let me extend it and add reviews to product. So now when the end users or the, the front end engineers are querying, now product has reviews in it, like out of the get, get go, like you, with product now you can, you can find reviews in product, but you and the product team didn't really add this. Um, so this is great because one, it automatically unifies your entire infrastructure into one super graph. Um, but additionally, um, as you're developing, there are chances where, what if I'm extending something that breaks something else? Or what if I delete something that, um, the questions you might be wondering, like how would this, all of this work? So we graph OS, there is additional safeguard and tools built into it that, for example, let's say you just wanted to delete something just for fun. Graph OS uses all of that operation analysis and all of that to make a regressive um, algorithm to say like, oh, okay, do, do like a regression and say, well, if you were to delete title, this is what is gonna happen. Um, this operations like top product, customer, active cart that are requested by Android, iOS, web, in production and in staging will be broken. Um, and then you have the ability to kind of override and see what is going on. Um, but the value of this is that back in the day, um, when we made changes to API, let's say you're on REST, you do like V1, V2, V3. Um, we used to have what we call like, you know, when you go through the train analogy, when you do like regression where like teams go through like clicking every button to make sure everything is good and all the responses are good. Now, a lot of that is just shifted to the left because as you're developing, even before you push to GitHub, you can know the impact of your change before you make them. Um, and we've seen a lot of teams that um, are very, like the examples that Dan has been calling like on, on the logo slide, a lot of times moving fast is not about how quickly you can punch in code, is that you don't have to go back 100 times when you make a progress, right? Um, so that's what we've seen that with a lot of the ability to one, compose different schemas into one super graph um, has been like a value add, being able to, as a, with a new developer or different team, explore that graph just interactively to understand it. You're able to search it. You're able to make requests. You're able to do different things. Um, has been really, really good. You're also able to see the performance of the graph, solve C errors, uh, mitigate things and solve problems. Um, but at the same time, prevent you from moving fast and breaking things that you can move fast, but in a very safe manner. Um, I think this is some of the highlights of why this has been a game changer for like teams like Walmart or the world. Yeah. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Toby. The, um, the, I think it's easy to forget. I'm going to flip my screen on here. Um, how rare it is to be able to see and know which of your API clients um, are using what data and what's the whole picture? Because when we fragment it up and they ask the service, you know, the user service for this and the product service for this and the pricing service for that, each of those teams gets a view. Oh, I'm getting pressure from that API consumer. They don't know which subfields they're using and they don't know about the right. larger request. And so right. what's amazing right. is if you actually get to see the full request that the front ends ask for, then the, op the optimization opportunities show up. You're like, oh, you're, you always ask for that with mine? Well, that service is 10 times slower than mine. 
Right. So you're going to have a problem because if you're waiting around for that thing, so then they can say, well, maybe we could cache. Maybe I could return some of that data so that it could, since I've got a faster cache than they do, it opens up the opportunity for you to see the full customer experience request and just think more big picture about how your APIs work. Yeah. And the way I've kind of positioned it to a lot of my enterprise counterparts, it's just, it helps you make data-driven conversations. Like you have data-driven. So when you're talking with different teams, different engineers, you can show the query plan. This is what the request you're making. And this is what the response time is. This is what you're combining, right? Um, and then you can, as a team, um, make progress. I think this is hugely different from my, uh, I've been yeah. a developer for many years. It's like kind of, you know, we're just doing like a vibe driven approach. You know, it's just like, oh, you know, uh, maybe if we change this, like we're just hoping that things will work. But now you have that very specific data points that you need. Excellent. Um, I think, do we, I don't know if we have any gym front end folks here. I bet they're mostly back end. I would bet back end, but I'm not sure. Yeah. There might be some front end people. Uh, we have had some questions coming in, but Van yeah. is uh, taking care of them uh, in, the, yeah. in the in the chat. But there's one. Looks like Anoop is has Angular yeah. React, and he did have a a question on just kind of trying to get it placed in his mind, like the well, you know what, GraphQL Anoop, layer. Like, is it just let's, like the middleware and the back end? Exactly. Do you have, do you have some, are you getting into that? A little I bit? do. I do. I'm going to set you up with a little bit of an architecture picture here that shows. But you're absolutely your instincts are right. This sits in the middle between the front and the back, and we'll talk about that in just a sec. So let's see if we can. All right. Um, let's get into that. So back into the flow. Orchestration obviously important. But there are other ways to orchestrate, right? We've been doing it for a long time, Toby, right? We've built orchestra. I've, re I've built them. You've done it. Um, so here's an example of a couple of scenarios that show up a lot. Like when you first did mobile apps, they're like, I can't talk to all your services. Give me something in the middle. Make a gateway for me that talks mobile to me. And then I don't care what behind. So that, that happened. And then orchestration APIs, they're like, and you see this at, in large organizations, we see multiple orchestration tiers. Right. There's an orchestrator that calls an orchestrator that calls a service. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but here's the thing about orchestration layers. If they're if they're API gateways in the sense of like a Kong or Apogee, they're just really mapping and counting and protecting all those endpoints, but they're not model mapping, they're not transforming. That's not what they do, right? They're pass-throughs. And then that doesn't reduce the complexity that we're looking for. And if they're done this way, so this big pattern we mentioned it earlier, but BFF that blew up about five. Four, it's only really four four years ago or so. I went back and looked. It's 2019 or something, Toby, when that term was coined by SoundCloud. Right. It's It has exploded in parallel with GraphQL. And the basic idea is just, what if we looked at the problem the other way? It's brilliant. It's like, look at it from the consumer side, from the front end side. What do you need? What data do you, does the view model need? Instead of thinking down, what does the service have? And that's a really neat mental exercise because you realize... Well, I may have a lot of things, but they don't need it or they don't need it that way. So BFFs became really, um, really prolific. The problem with them is not that the concept of intermediating and thinking about the consumer's needs of the, your APIs, that's brilliant. The problem is that they solve one problem for one chunk of UI. And whereas in the beginning, Toby, we would make one for like iOS and then get really big and become a little monolith, which was a problem. And we had to do it three times, iOS, Android, and the web. Yeah. And sometimes, um, from my experience, uh, there have been a time where, like, we had a BFF that abstracted, like, an ordering framework. Yeah. And then that company got bought by another company. <laughs> so I have to swap it out. Um, and it wasn't a great experience, I'll no. tell you that. So what, what we see happen, and I mean this both conceptually, but also like literally we see this, Toby works with these organizations, I do every day too, is that as they move that pattern to micro front ends now, pieces of apps, little views, if you, you get a pattern where you're like the solution to every piece of UI is build a custom bespoke API for it, and then have that API talk to all the complexity. And that works for the micro team. It really does. I'm going to be honest. But this is what happens. I mean, your favorite fintech companies have hundreds of these, hundreds. One I visited this uh, summer has 600 micro little BFF APIs. 
you could guess that their architecture team really wasn't sort of paying attention to that because they're like, oh, they're little front end, you, who cares? Well, if you have 600 of anything, what are you supposed to do when you need to migrate them or clean up a context object or change your auth model or anything? You've got a real mess there. So while the concept of having something tuned for the front end is a good one, this technology, SOA, is not built for this. Endpoint-based API is not designed for this problem. It's designed for a, different, for a, a more traditional problem. And that's when GraphQL and the query language those you know comes together and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Much like a database, if we want to just express intent or need from the front ends, let's make a query. Let's define an abstract question to ask of some magic door, if you will, single endpoint. We post it or we get it. There's lots of different ways to do it. This isn't, there's nothing, this is the other thing about GraphQL, you guys. It's just a JSON document that you're sending to the server. It's just that the way it gets broken up and then compartmentalized and sent out to the different services, that's kind of the magic, but there's nothing new under the sun here. We've sent JSON documents and got JSON responses for a long time now. But what's unique here is the client's needs are changing at a very fast rate. The backend services are changing more slowly. There's an impedance mismatch. There's a shear force between the two. Graph is a way, a middleware, as Anoop was pointing out, that handles that translation. So many clients and many queries, that means they can have as many queries as you need, but you don't have to write custom integrations. And then the backend figures out how to map those to many different endpoints. Um, now, two points of caution before we live on this thing on this architecture that we call federated GraphQL and the super graph. Um, to a, a warning, anything that works will grow in your organization <laughs> and GraphQL works. So what happens? It gets bigger. So what starts out as a team level or group level GraphQL grows because of the network adjacency problem, right? It's or not problem, but opportunity. It's like I've returned stuff about product, let's say. And then it's like, oh, can I get the pricing information? Can you add some stuff about pricing? Oh, okay, yeah, I could add pricing and then connect it to product or reviews. So it starts to grow and it wants to grow because its clients, once they get the taste of it, they're like, if I get all that from one endpoint, I don't want to have to call those other side endpoints. Can't you just get into the graph? So there becomes this little market economy of the graph. It grows, but who's managing the schema? It's The schema gets enormous and now to make a safe change or to reason about what should be done there, you need a council of Elrond type meeting, if you understand that Tolkien reference there, but you need everybody to get together. And the way you're safe is by meeting and talking and strat. And, and that's slow because now you have a choke point. So Netflix has a fantastic video on this. They did a couple of years ago that explained why they ran into this problem. Everybody who's used GraphQL at scale, if they try to do it as a single service, single server with a single schema they hit this breaking point so the the industry um tried to do schema stitching where we just kind of mashed the schemas together into a superset that didn't really have the metric the uh the um the sort of ergonomics we wanted and so we came up with apollo working with netflix because they were doing something similar came up with something called federation and before I explain Federation, I'm just going to show you, again, that front-to-back Anoop architecture. Starting from the clients, we want them to be thinking about product-centric concerns. What do you need to power your experiences? Not where is that data, where the endpoint is, and what the service is, but what's the data that you need? And then you describe that need in a query. You send it to something we call the router. It then, there's a fleet of those routers, of course. It's not really a single endpoint. It's just conceptually a single endpoint. Now, um, the next bit here is flip it to the right side. What we want on the right is all that, we wanna harness all the capabilities. We don't wanna rewrite it. We don't want, we're not saying change your whole domain tier to GraphQL, right? That's, that's crazy talk. Um, what we wanna say is harness all that capability, allow it to relate to each other and connect in a graph, but we can't have the graph as a single thing. So how do we do that? We want to allow teams to build a graph of graphs. So each team, Toby was talking about, owns that piece of the schema. They own it, they, they connect, but then you can make relationships to say, oh, well, there's a connection between product and price and reviews. And that connection is just based on, on the keys that you'd expect to be shared. And that way, the, the sum right is greater than the whole, right? It starts to grow and connect and I don't have to replicate information that another team does because I can just kind of link to it. 
Um, but it doesn't require that we have direct bindings. It's a declarative sort of logical binding between the two association, but it's not like we've made the services have to be hardwired connected with each other. And put together, this is sort of the architecture that the industry has landed on for GraphQL. At scale, you need a graph of graphs approach with this federation, which allows you to associate what we call entities together. You need um, all the tooling that kind of Toby showed you, and there's a lot more. We've literally spent the last half dozen years with a lot of devs building all the different components that are required to run GraphQL at the scale of large organizations like Saber. Um, so that's the basic architecture. I'm gonna pause for a minute, look over, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about Federation. So let's see, how's the data schema managed? Yeah, given data caching, liveliness. Yeah, there's a lot there. Let's, John, thank you for that. Let's talk about that in the Q&A section because I think it's kind of a free ranging conversation. Um, I think I only have a few more slides, Toby. I just was gonna show a few sort of conceptual, uh, um, Anoop asks about Kubernetes. We'll talk about mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, we'll talk about the sort of, I don't have a diagram of the runtime plane and the control plane. I don't know, maybe you can pull one up, Toby. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. That's always useful for devs to understand, like, where, where is this running? <laughs> right, right, right. I, I left it out of my talk, I apologize. Let me just show a couple more slides and then a close out. Um, okay, this federation concept. Well, all we're saying is the way we break up the schemas into sub schemas, if you will, or sub graphs, as we call them is really a lot about our teams, right? It's kind of a Conway's Law thing. It's like, who owns product? That team probably wants to have a subgraph, right? And they want local control over that because that's their biz. And then a team that owns reviews has their own subgraph. You could put those together and you can start with only one of them or you can start with two of them or you can start with 12 of them. It turns out that you want the number that fits your organization you don't want to build, I'm not a, like Toby, I don't know, I'm just saying this and see if you have a different opinion, but you know, like the serverless, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, a Lambda for every single thing. We're not talking right. about that kind of level of granularity because <laughs> that's yeah. a mess. That means you've just got hundreds of these things. Right. Um, big, bigger and chunkier seems to work better and aligned around team boundaries and domain boundaries. Um, but the beauty of this indirection layer, if you see that big sort of long, um, rectangle there called the supergraph schema. It's representing that from the outside, from the client's view, they only see the endpoint in this composed schema. They don't see the boundaries between the different subgraphs. And that's important because you want to hide that. That's an abstraction or it's a, it's a, it's a mechanism for decomposition. So in time, if you start with, say you had a product subgraph that offered all the things we know about product and one of them was reviews and then you decided to put a lot more money into your review subsystem and you broke out that team into its own team and you said i want to and they you then you can break out that move into its own subgraph the front end teams don't have to know the contract doesn't change it's just how you're breaking up the work right and that's important for large organizations because we want that flexibility we know our teams are going to be changing the reorders are happening architecturally or politically um, we don't want those to affect our API endpoints. And this is an architecture that lets you decouple those things. Um, so in this example here, I had, they were in two chunks, then they moved to four. The point is you do that breakup when it's appropriate, when you need it to, it's on demand. You don't have to have broken it up ahead of time. Um, you can use the, the right shape of that and still have the contract be the same. And in this example, in this example, the query doesn't change. But the way it's resolved changes. Anything you want to add there, Toby, or did that? No, I think you you covered it pretty well. Um, and I don't describe actual entities and how yeah. you do the linking and stuff. That's a deep, more detailed conversation. But yeah, um, I'm going to sum up with a couple slides just on um, the benefits. So we talked a lot about the we talked about the front end, the perf optimization of a single query, a single call response. Um, only getting the data I want. We didn't really touch on it, Toby, but the code gen. Right, right, right. It's just so lovely. It just makes all that model mapping code for you. You don't um, have to write it. Straightforward. Yeah. Um, it also, though, on that lower left there, the backend teams. It turns out that they are at least as attracted to this. They don't recognize it as often early, but they're like, wait a second. I have a single client over time that becomes the graph. It's a strongly typed contract right? It's one that is stable. I don't have to version. I can have, I have a mechanism for um, 
um, for deprecating fields, I no longer want to support. And then the the clients will get a message saying, hey, we're really trying to move away from this field. We've moved first name to name. Can you please try to use the new field as rather than having to do endpoints? And they get that abstraction, which means that they can then, once they're behind that strongly typed contract, they can change implementation. They can move to the cloud. They can change to Elasticsearch or whatever it is. And they don't have to change their endpoint schemas, which is really powerful because it lets them focus on optimizing the important bits around perf or something. Um, I got to get off this phone here because we got to get to talk questions. So I'm just going to say um, we got some swag and there's a con there's some feedback. So there's a screenshot to take in a QR code. Give us some feedback on how this went. Did it make sense? And we'd love to send you some swag. Who doesn't like swag? That's my yeah. favorite hat. And then um, I would like to share real quick just the... Oh, yes. Just, yeah. I just wanted to sh conceptualize the, where things live. Um, so, yeah, let's show that. Oh, and then I will show one more slide. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, Jim, we can go a tiny bit long and cut into... We don't have a hard stop, right? Because we're, we have a social networking stuff, yeah, right? There's not a hard stop. There's not a hard okay. stop. So we'll, uh, okay. Um, we can dribble into it a little bit. Yep. Yeah, Toby, walk us through this really quick so people understand what they're looking at. Awesome. Um, so when we talked about all those subgraphs and we talked about all the different things that make up a super graph, um, if you look at this image, um, at the bottom of it um, is this dotted line, um, kind of, I guess you could call it yellow. Um, and basically, that is describing your cloud infrastructure. So, for example, the router is basically similar to how you implement any other cloud tool is it's a YAML config um, that you can deploy on your Kubernetes infrastructure, whether you're AWS or Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure. Um, so that is independent, so you could deploy it anywhere. Um, and then similar, your subgraphs today would, similar way you deploy your servers, even how you deploy your REST servers. Um, they're basically just GraphQL servers, right? So you deploy those in your cloud, in your infrastructure, your apps are in your infrastructure as well. Um, and so the part that I was um, demoing earlier that you saw um, with Apollo Studio, um, that is what is in Apollo's um, cloud. Um, and so that helps you to explore your graph it helps you to observe, like we saw, govern your graph. It has a lot to do with the management of your super graph infrastructure. Um, and then there's also Apollo Registry, which, um, you know, when we talk about, let's say you're in a product subgraph and you publish a schema and someone else is on the review subgraph and they publish a schema, how do those schemas come into to become a super graph? That happens in the Apollo Registry. And the Apollo Registry, you can think of it similar to how GitHub is for your code. Apollo registry is that source control for your graph. Um, and it manages like the composition of your super graph. Um, so that happens automatically. Um, so a lot of times then Dan was talking about the difference between BFF and this, and it's the, the big takeaway is that back in the day, um, when two things were related or one needed to be joined together, somebody had to write that code to say, you take this from here, you take a, you take B, you glue them together, and you serve it as a new API. Today, all of that work is going away um, because we're now, instead of having all that imperative code and logic, um, that disappears and you just have a more declarative architecture that is automatically composed for you um, as a super graph. So the registry does a lot of, pretty much it does that automatic composition of your declarative schemas. Um, so now, um, you can make requests. Um, you don't have to understand how product and reviews glue together. You just have to write the schema and Federation takes care of all the, all the rest of that. Um, so that Apollo Studio, the registry, those live in Apollo Cloud, um, but everything else lives in your infrastructure. Um, yeah. If you use Kubernetes, that's how it's going to be. Yeah, and we've got some new stuff coming out where we host. Some of our customers have asked us, we don't really want to run the router on our prem. Can you host it for us? And so we're putting bringing that to market too. Yep, yep, uh, yep, 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 yep. Yep. Let me just just show this one last screen, Jim, before we get to Q and A. Right. One last slide I didn't get to because I I'm too much of a talker. Yeah. So the learn more. Um, there is a there's a bunch of ways you can learn more. There's a link here. Uh, maybe we can share this in the in the um I'll, I'll do it as soon as we get out of here i'll put it in chat but there's a discord community we have 
for devs to talk about all things GraphQL. We have, um, if you go to our website slash events, you'll see upcoming events. This is the one that is coming up in November that is interesting for you. And there's a QR code that goes right to that event registration. And then if you're one of the folks um, who are actually really interested in GraphQL and bringing it to your organization and figuring out how do I champion this at my org or I'm trying to bring GraphQL in. And um, we have a group of people that, that I lead a community of that are those folks, the architects and the internal champions evangelists, Jim, for this particular tech. And we gather and share uh, and support one another as we sort of try to make tech change, which isn't always easy, is it, Jim, to bring new things into old organizations? Yeah, it can take a while. <laughs> it can take a while. Um, so those are the three things. And then I think, oh, yeah, this was just the leftover to the wrap up slide. But I think that that is it. And we can um, stop sharing. Right. And maybe you can make folks presenters and we can see each other. So or you, tell me, be, you tell me. In between, so we'll do a little bit of Q and A okay. uh, in, in this scenario. Then we'll uh, we'll switch. You know, take, take, take a break, five minute break, and then come okay. back. Uh, but I do uh, have a little bit of question. Uh, yeah. You know, Van's been doing a great job answering things in the chat. So we, uh, I think he's covered pretty much everything there, and you've covered things there. But on uh, like uh, on on the incoming side, how do you handle the uh, authentication and authorization because there may be data yeah. sources in the back end that somebody that you want people to be able to ask for but only the people that have permission to ask for that thing yeah i'm gonna give um we just had toby a meetup today where um chandrika and dylan gave a talk on off in the router so i will give a little bit um of that perspective so the answer of course with security is always defense in depth so there is no one layer that you want to do security so at the service tier you still need to be doing it all the way down there but interestingly this schema that we've been talking about is a really natural place to apply policy right and security is one of those policies so there is a capability um in the language of GraphQL itself, in the scheme language where you can do um, directives. And one of the directives, we're adding an authentication and a scopes sort of require scopes thing. So you can actually decorate your scheme itself and define, I need authentication here as checked by like a JWT token, um, or I need a certain amount of scope privilege to be able to return this data. And mm -hmm. um, and you can do that in sort of a lightweight way, or you can, and, or you can hook up what we call a coprocessor. So you can write your own code and do, you know, checking of claims or validation so there's a so moving to a declarative kind of auth is a really powerful way you can implement our back or a back that way so we're really excited about that that's just now in public preview so okay. auth is is now part of the graph in addition to those claims also needing to make their way down to the low level services mm -hmm. you don't want to just trust the graph but <laughs> The last thing I would say is it is really nice to catch traffic from a denial of service perspective if you can block it at the graph tier at the router, this is very efficient. Like you never have to bother your services with it. Right. And I know that from the Expedia days, we got tons of pressure from bots and other kinds of things. So having that capacity is a really nice one. I hope that answered the question. Was there anything I missed in there, Toby? Van, Van, actually we should have thrown this to Van. Van it <laughs> came from security. He lives this yeah. stuff. Van, anything? Are you, I don't know if you're on just text he, or. He, he's just on chat. He's just he's on just chat. On, okay. Anyway. Yeah. If you have more questions, follow up with us. Uh, we can go a lot deeper. <laughs> on, uh, I don't see any more in the Q and A chat, but I do have a yeah. non-technical question mm. that I ask everybody. And Dan and Toby both can maybe give your uh, opinion on this scenario. It's a career development question. Ah. So if you, uh, knowing what you know now, and it's. Uh, the joke answer is usually yeah. buy Apple. The joke answer is usually buy Apple stock. <laughs> but uh, if you could go back in time uh, and give yourself some uh, career advice, maybe as a young twenty-year-old, you know what? Uh, what kind of career advice would you uh, have given yourself? Oh man, I could I could do a book on that. Um, <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is my first job. I went to a liberal arts school, took physics, got to th year three, and realized, yeah, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be a physicist, um, but I had taken a lot of math, started to do computer science and got a minor in computer science. So now I'm like looking for a job. Nobody would hire me as a, cause back then you had to have a four year degree to, to work yeah. at like Microsoft. 
ended up working for a local small town company that was doing like odd job stuff and worked at a paper mill on a Fortran roll tracking inventory system that was on a mini computer with hex. I mean, it was just like ancient, not NASA. <laughs> and I called my father and I'm like, well, my career's over. I'm in the basement of a paper mill. This is <laughs> so my first piece of advice is this. It turned out that those three years there were amazing because I got to work directly with people who used software I wrote in their daily life. And that is something you don't get at the time. And we were all building shrink wrap software and working on it for two years and putting it on a disc or a yeah. CD or something. And you got no feedback from customers. So what I would say on the one side is every job you have in tech is an enormous opportunity to learn some part of the big puzzle. And it's less crucial. I think what I learned is that you can find really interesting problems to get really passionate about and learn from at any place. So when you, whether that's in your own company, if you get the project, that's not what you think is the cool project, right there, you, you can make an impact on every piece of software. Even if that is, we should retire this piece of software. Let me show you why we should let it go. Um, so I use that attitude in my career to always just try to bring an interest to learn and curiosity um, and try to make everything I touched better or suck less, um, <laughs> which is sometimes the only strategy you have. Um, yeah. So that, that's my biggest piece of career advice is find something you're interested in, follow it, and then keep your eyes open for the next opportunity and then follow that. There's no, also no perfect direct path. My son is in college and he's like, I want to get the perfect. And I'm like, there's no perfect. Toby's <laughs> path is all over the place. My path is all <laughs> over the place. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. All right. Yeah. No, thanks, Dan. Uh, Toby, what uh, you, you had uh, some time to think about it. Yeah. Uh, what, what would you what would you say? Dan, the more you talked, the more your answer was getting similar to mine. Ah. Um, but <laughs> I think my biggest piece of advice generally, um, like Dan said, it's all over the place. Your career is unpredictable. Um, and one of my personally, one of like my um, natural leanings is to is to be very like certain about something like i'm i'm very like like dancer like i grew up doing physics chemistry bio like they had definite answers and we do research and we come up with precise answers but i think the biggest level of growth comes when there's no nobody knows the answer um so solving or working on problems where you don't know the answer and your boss doesn't know the answer and somebody has to figure it out. I think initially when I started my career as an intern, it's more like, oh, just tell me what to do and I would execute to the highest level possible. But as time went on, I found that like start getting to more interesting problems where we all don't know the answer and we are yeah. figuring out we're we're of course being intentional about like trying to solve the problem. Um, but kind of just being courageous to step into, well, no, no matter the company, to step into the unanswered questions where there is no guideline of like, okay, this is how you do this because nobody else knows how to do it. Um, and we are all figuring out, and if we figure it out, it, it's going to be a great experience. And so just embracing, I think, problem solving, embracing uncertainty, of course, it should match with you, you. You should have some level of passion and interest in that thing, because if you're not interested in it, then it will be a very boring and like frustrating process. But if you're like Dan said, if you're excited about something or at least have remote interest in it, even though the answers do not exist yet, you will have enough internal uh, motivation to keep going to figure it out. Um, and I think just embracing just even not just work outside of life, when you step out of that comfort zone of where you don't know, and there's nobody to tell you, because they also don't know, I think it's a great place to be. Um, but in when you're in there in the moment, it's not fun, because everybody's mad at everybody, because they're like, ah, <laughs> oh, this is not working. How is it gonna work? Um, but that's one of the joys of working at a startup. That. Nobody knows. <laughs> great question, Jim. All right, no, that's uh, that's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, Toby, Dan, 
Uh, thanks for for taking uh, time out of your uh, your day to uh, to join us.